Greetings. Welcome to the show. This is episode 79 to the airships. Happy Friday, all. Good to see you. Um, yesterday was amazing. The uh, uh, generosity from the super chatters was just stellar, and and honestly, the uh, patrons, there's, it's so great what's happening. This is the uh, yesterday was the eleventh show uh, th- that has been rated as unsuitable for advertising, and I think it's hilarious that uh, th- that it's something that that we can laugh about, especially if you consider um, the kinds of things we've been talking about about uh, r- really the uh, the newfound strength that comes in in seeing the world for what it truly is um and they're saying no no you cannot um that's not advertiser friendly dude you need to be pushing covid right you need to be pushing whatever else so thanks for being here thanks for being here um i I, uh love bear simon 33 Andrea Fagan, Callie Burnsdorf, Civatique, Sergeant Bear, Kay Jones, Coldy, Chris Jones, Inger Oha, Sergeant Bear, again, Logos Bear, Gaia Bear, Anthony Patron, Silver Slipner 22, Callie Burnsdorf, Colton Poole, Stature Man, City of Maple Bear, Simon 33, again, Ripson, Joseph Paul, Jennifer Davenport, David, and purple rose bear thank you guys for everything yesterday and look at that we already have Tryon and Mag coming in today um, I just seriously it, it just it it has me floating all day to see this and uh, it's the best apocalypse ever um, even as the as the powers that be do what they do it it, it just keeps coming. It is so much gravy, as Berserker Bear Buffalo Dustin uh, w- would say. Um, so yeah, let's get started. If an airship was to appear, would you go? Would you climb on the airship? Would you trust it? Would you fear it? Would it depend on the color or the costume of the captain who came out and offered you a seat? What would be your first reaction when you consider the idea of leaving Dojo Earth on an airship? Think about it. Ask your emotional self, what's your first reaction to that? Is it good or is it bad? Is it exciting or is it scary? I would say to you that more of us are afraid than are willing to admit that we are. That more of us are actually enjoying the chains of Dojo Earth. But we're only going to enjoy it as long as the chains appear to be placed on us by someone else. It is a uh, fetish for bondage. Um, It is a fetish for uh, confine me so that I may feel safe. This is a soothing mechanism that we use on a uh, harmonic higher level of zeitgeistiosity, of, of zeitgeisterosity. We use the zeitgeist to comfort ourselves by restricting where we can look, um, and we require that outside restriction to appear to be the thing that's causing it, not us. I would argue that the legalization, that the illegalization, that I would argue that our war on cannabis has actually been one of those uh, soothing effects, that most of us do not like what cannabinoids do to our aperture, and it frankly freaks us the fuck out. And we're like, dude, I do not want to be anointed. I do not want to understand. I would rather understand less. I would rather everything be material. I would rather become the Medusa 
than have to face demons. It is convenient for us to dismiss what we see as demons and push them away, much like YouTube demonetizes our videos, they are pushing things away. And it's providing a service that people find helpful. People who are not ready to have their apertures open. Uh, you cannot force someone into a haunted house without causing them harm. Even though haunted houses are fun, to push someone into that haunted house would be to traumatize them, to terrify them. And you may have thoughts about, well, you know, if they just do it, it'll be okay. But the act of forcing them actually amplifies what it feels like. You have to enter the haunted house by your own volition. And when you do, you've been into a contract with that haunted house, and you agree to be scared. You do this on a roller coaster. You do this, uh, heck, you'll do this on a first date. You'll do this, uh, um... And right before you're giving your free speech, right? We'll either make it or we'll crack up, right? Yesterday I had a great show. Wednesday I had a horrible show. Oh my God, it was so bad. But because of my uh, fuel, I can take those hits and I can still go into the haunted house, right? I can still say, no, I wanna go back. I want to go back. And the people that go back, the people that open their aperture, are really what you would call um, paladins of truth. These are the ones that find their own line and push. And each of us are our own paladin because we are pushing the idea of our own identity. We are pushing the idea of our own aperture, of our own focus, which has its own timeline, its own ancestors. It has its own DNA line. That's how serious it is. <clears throat> and so we find ways to push and push and ride the taller roller coaster, right? Go into the scarier haunted house. Uh, learn to want to see your own demons, not push them away. This is not a call for everyone to smoke cannabis. That's not what I'm saying. I'm trying to explain to you that to make things illegal uh, serves the very people that are denied from it. It gives them a sense of comfort that comes in with that. Bacon Bear tip for a legend. Thank you, sir. Thanks for the super chat. There is a difference between these two people. The one with the bigger aperture is hungry, the one with the smaller aperture is full. And I would argue that what we're seeing through history, what we're seeing right now with the masks, with the COVID, with the rapture of stupidity, is that struggle between those that are hungry for wisdom and those that are opposing it. In the turn of the century, 18th century, we were discovering things that were frankly astounding we were making uh, strides in every field imaginable and and as we made those strides some of us embraced it some of us were hungry for that knowledge while others were terrified they were like I do not like this I would rather us slow down we have that today we had that when the internet came we had that when television came. We had that when radio came. We had that when roads came. And people like Amy Polino, who just super chatted me, said, no, we will press on. And that's literally progress, but, but we miss how much anti-progress comes with progress, how much of a resistance to that progress is built into this system. And airships dirigibles are a prime example of cannabinoids. We made cannabis illegal because we did not want to be anointed. Why do you keep saying anointed, James? There's a scientific evidence. I hate using the word scientific. Like just last year, 
they were peeling off the top of the altar, off, off of some altars in Jerusalem. And they took what they peeled off and they found traces of cannabinoids, of, of cannabis, uh, evidence that cannabis was being used heavily in uh, Jewish temples, Christian temples. And I called up my, my resident local go-to alchemist, Benjamin Balderson, and we spoke about this idea. And he's coming on tomorrow. We're going to expand on it more. But what you're going to see tomorrow is what you're going to see today. But today it's airships. Tomorrow it's cannabis. You see people that do not want to be anointed. If you watch someone who uh, smokes cannabis and freaks out, and keep in mind back then they weren't smoking it. It was anointed in them. They were Mashiach. Messiah was the anointed one. It was soaking into your skin. And if they could dilate your pores just right with just the right amount of frankincense or myrrh, then that cannabinoids could seep deep into the fat of your skin and become a tool for your aperture. And you would see shit. You would feel things. And people would either freak out or embrace it. Two kinds of people in this world. Two kinds of people in every dimension, I should say, right? In one dimension, hot sauce, they embrace it. In the dimension of cannabinoids, they reject it. And just like that, there is a generation that embraced the airship, and there's another generation that rejected the airship. And these dirigibles, that's the word for airships, I did not know that, they were on the scene as early as... 1899, Count Ferdinand Van Zeppelin began um, began with the first. Pardon me, guys. I have to turn on my hot keys. I forgot about that. Excuse me. Pardon me. Turn in on my hot keys. Turn in on my hot keys. Where are they, hot keys? Yeah, 79. This should have been done before we started. Oh shit, I can't seem to find them. Of course that would happen because I waited till we are alive. Oh shit, where are they? It's called 7-9 airships. I would like to be able to control you. Shit, sorry guys. Hot keys. Freaking A, man. 7-9 airships. 7-9 airships, not there. Where are they? Where are they? Holy shit. Here they are. God, that took forever. By the way, chat is freaking hilarious. I, I was reading last night really funny, funny stuff there. Next slide. Next slide, previous slide. Next slide, previous slide. I'm sorry about this, guys. Here we go. Okay, thanks for the super chat, Golden Pool. All right, this should work now. We began a fascination with these things. Before the, before the turn of the, 18th, of the 19th century, right? We were using these airships. Military was, wasn't using them. They were over cities, considered safe. Oh, we're getting to that, sorry. All these countries, it was considered the best way to go to the North Pole. The reason why they tell you now that flights cannot cross the South Pole is because it's too dangerous to be that cold. If you look at stories of World War II, you're told that the reason why Germany failed to invade uh, England, I mean uh, Russia, was because the gasoline froze. Their motor engines were not able to penetrate. But we had airship bases in the, uh, on the South Pole. We had airship bases uh, up north on the North Pole. I mean, not obviously on the North Pole itself. But this was a very, very economical, controllable, excellent way of doing it. This wasn't like one or two airships, guys. Look at them. They're, these are all different versions. Now, we're going to get to Hindenburg, but I just want you to first see. Look, 
these are all working airships for four decades, five decades. And booking tripes, uh, flights to Europe. American Airlines had their own fleet of them. The Graf Zeppelin was a uh, uh, design, much like an Etzel, right? It, it, had, it had its own system and was built around the world. Could dock up to any... It was a, it was a wonder and a marvel. But in the 18th century, while dreamers were trying to create amazing things, while they were traveling to the North and quote, quote, South Pole in the most efficient way possible, there were others that were getting scared. People were growing terrified of airships. When I say that, what I mean by that is, is what I'm about to show you shows that there was an appetite to slow down. There was an appetite that was asking you, hey, I don't want this. Thanks for the super chat, Joseph Paul. Ferdinand Adolf Henrik August Graf von Zeppelin. First day of school must have been funny. Um, Rocky Roberts, I'm going to have to just time you out pretty much whenever I see you. The, the reason why is because you're just such a dick on the comments, man. It's just like every day, dude, it's like multiple comments about what a dick you are. So just whenever I see you, I don't even look at your stuff anymore, Rocky Roberts. It's just, it's just why? Why would we want that riffraff wandering around our aisles? It's just such a freaking waste of time. Dude, I have to make it expensive for you to be such a douchebag. I mean, fuck, dude grow something. You've been in here for weeks telling me how much you fucking hate me. If you're going to wander around the chat, man, at least at least contribute to something. Fuck. God, man. I mean, I, 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 I salute you for your douchebaggery, I guess. Each of us have to find ways to strive and reach new ground. And I think that you definitely have learned to scratch the surface on the glass ceiling of douchebaggery with Rocky Roberts. You've found that glass ceiling and you're hitting it and you're just not going to give up. So, way to go, buddy. Seriously. So, th these airships were used in World War I. We bombed London with them very successfully. In fact, they became so successful that part of the World War I treaty was no more airships. You guys can't make airships, Germany. You're making them too well. We don't want your freaking airships anymore. It became standard practice. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because I've always had a suspicion about USGS, uh, United States Geological Survey. The suspicion I've had is going back to the Queen, going back to the Queen of England. I'm sorry, not the Queen. Of, what my name is the United Kingdom. But uh, I wrote this down. I don't want you to think that I knew this, but I've always, uh, here's what I mean. I've always found it fascinating that, uh, that the United Kingdom has pretty much been in charge of all navigation maps of the ocean. And the reason why they were in charge of all navigation maps is because they wrote a piece where they said, we are going to make the most detailed map of the world that anyone's ever seen. And they promised that it would be basically, was a one inch per square mile? Yeah, an inch per mile. And in 1747, I'd like you to try and picture how amazing that would be to be anyone who's trying to learn anything about everything and to find that an encyclopedia salesman has knocked on your door and said, I have a map of the world that's the most accurate map ever created. Would you like a copy? And you're like, well, sure, how much? And the guy at the door says, it's free. And they're like, wait a minute, surely this must be some sort of trick. And the encyclopedia salesman is like, no, we're the government and we just love you and we just really want you to have this map. We just think that if you have this map, the world will be a more peaceful place. And you, being naive back in 1747, you're like, you guys are great. I'm going to take this map 
I'm going to throw away this crazy scrawlings that I had from my grandfather. This wasn't one inch per mile. In fact, this has a serpent guy drawn in the corner. And it's got this weird ass shit that I've never even seen. And you adopt the better system. You adopt the more intelligent choice. And overnight, everyone is now using the same map. Everyone is now charting the seas using the exact same measurement system and map. And if any of you have ever hid anything from your brother, from your parents, from your spouse, I don't know, from, from anything, you understand that there is a certain instrument of hiding. There is a method to it. And I'm here to tell you that if I wanted to hide an island or if I wanted to hide a room, from my very, very naive children who will listen to anything I give them, no matter how absurd, I would tell them that there is no basement. There is no man cave down there. What you think is down there is an illusion. Here is the real map of the house. And you can see plainly there's the first floor, there's the second floor, and there's the attic. And that's the entire house. And because, because these children are so naive, they never check. They don't. Not only do they not check, they build giant industries on top of it. Thank you, Guy Bear, for your cannabis endeavors. Let it take you to the starship. <laughs> Love your work. Thanks for being legit. Thank you. It's, uh, by the way, uh, not that Guy Bear is at all suggesting this. I, I Tomorrow we're going to be talking about cannabis a lot. And I, I, I am not here to say that you guys should be smoking cannabis. In fact, I'm hoping to explain to you that in Egypt, in Judaic culture, in fact, right now at the Holy Temple, uh, smoking cannabis every day or rubbing it into your skin every day or having an edible every day or whatever is actually not... Uh, not really that great when it comes to being anointed. The, your, your aperture opens because it's closed. There, there is a timing. It's almost like a, a, uh, a tide kind of thing. We'll, we'll get to that tomorrow. We'll, we'll get to that tomorrow. But uh, I know that whenever... We, it, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about it. It doesn't even bother me. Someone asked me the other day, are you stoned every day when you're on... And I'm just like, no, no. It, there is a video called the spinach in my refrigerator and if you were to watch that video you would see me give a 20 minute riff on the spinach packets in my refrigerator it would be silly for you to think that i maybe was not stoned when i did that video but these live streams no this is uh this is work for me what i mean is is that i'm i'm here to really really hopefully put on a good show i would not be able to do that if if i was anointing myself <laughs> whether in lungs or in the skin it's it's not it's not for that it's a, it's, I really like this sacred ally approach to it, to the anointing part of it. I, I think it's a really fascinating way. The, the Egyptians used to break their measurements down in sevenths. And the reason why they broke them down in sevenths is because they had to make sure they never ended in a harmonic number that was uh, reserved for the pharaoh. Only the pharaoh could use certain ratios, the phi ratio, the Fibonacci, the 360. Anything that was considered divine in measurement was strictly forbidden by Egyptians when they were doing things that were uh, what we call profane. Not profane like in the bad way, but what we call mundane, I should say. They used a very special kind of measurement that would, only, uh, that would not have them harmonically uh, creating. What I'm trying to say is, is that they would not use sacred numbers for mundane tasks. And I, I think that we should not use uh, sacred plants for mundane tasks, if that makes sense. Uh, coffee, I will drink every day. Um, you guys exercise the same thing. This is just part of our... Uh, it's part of learning our aperture. I'm getting way off topic here. I, I'm, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm stoned. Uh, that, that's a joke, by the way. 
These airships, these systems, we opened our aperture, we saw the potential, and we shrunk back. We started to shrink back. And there was a market for us wanting to shrink back. And that market was World War II. I think what happened was we adjusted to our maps, we bought into the encyclopedia that this is what the world looks like, and we liked it. And we rejected the Gleason map. We rejected, um, where is, yeah. This is the Gleason map. It's pretty famous, actually, like in the flat earth world or whatever. You could call it an azimuthal plane map, but really this, this was a map that when it was made, it was literally meant to be as it is. Um, the year of this Gleason map was 1892. In 1892, we had an ice wall. Th this is not Antarctica, guys. Look how, look how much landmass it is. This is an ice wall. And we got uncomfortable with that. We said, I, I don't like the idea that we don't know what's out there. This is very uncomfortable. Right? This is very uncomfortable is what it says. And so we look for something else to replace it. We, we, want, we want a complete earth. We want a whole earth. We want something with globalism. And I'm sorry, I blew that by showing you that. We ended up with this shaft head. This dude is Charles Doolittle Walcott. And in 1879, when we formed the USGS, people like this douchebag uh, stepped in, and in the creation of the USGS, we actually destroyed three ongoing surveys that were happening in America. We were actually mapping our world three different ways. Um, during that time, we created the USGS, and we eliminated all independent mapping agencies and replaced it with one. And this dude, Charles Doolittle Walcott, was the dude that made that happen. Uh, he was aligned with Carnegie. He was a paleontologist who made his money selling dinosaur bones to Yale, making a killing at it. And as he started to sell more and more bones, he started to notice there's a real market here for selling encyclopedias to children. I can knock on their door and say, I will solve the world for you. And any question that you have about what's beyond anything will no longer be a question. It will simply be known. All secrets will be revealed. And we have an appetite for that. Just like this girl, this guy. We have an appetite for knowing all things. We prefer that, in fact. We prefer it so much that we say, I don't want a Gleason map. I want this guy to tell me where everything is. Not only that, I think we should put him in charge of the Smithsonian. And they did. This guy was uh, ran the Smithsonian for nine years. 1907, oh, I'm sorry, for 20 years. 1907 through 1927. He was selling uh, some of the most, the largest uh, fossil collections ever were being exposed right then. And all of our mysteries were being solved in simple, concrete, ball earth solutions. And we loved it. We took it. We were not deceived. We were offered a choice and we took it. And we said, I don't want these airships. And in May 3rd, 1937, I believe that what happened was we had our first massive PSYOP. <clears throat> I'm talking about in America itself. Um on the Hindenburg. And the Hindenburg um, crashed May 3rd, 1937. 
And we don't know why it crashed. We actually don't know. We, um, we are telling ourselves it was spontaneous combustion. That's, that's, what, that's what we've been telling ourselves for a long time. But on May 3rd, 1937, um, 36 people died in an industry that had been flying across the North Pole for decades. It was normal for a Zeppelin to move from Germany to Rio de Janeiro, which, by the way, is like really not so far on a azimuthal plane Earth. <laughs> <laughs> on a globe, that's much more impressive, but on a, uh, on a Gleason map, that's not that unheard of if you think about it. We were normally making these trips back and forth until one day where all the press was invited for this one event. And in this one event, a fire broke out, and one of the most iconic disasters took place and I believe that most of you thought what I did that there was complete footage there was audio and there was video the entire thing was filmed on camera for all of us to see I believe that that you guys think that too so let's watch this again the van had uh, cracked up a little bit they backed motors so of the ship are just holding it uh but as we go, please understand that there are psyops in the world. And please listen to how he is telling you how bad it's going to be before it's bad. That's enough to keep it from... It burst into flames. Get this started. Get this started. It's rising. And it's rising. It's rising. Terrible. Oh, my. Get out of the way, please. It's burning and bursting into flames. And, and it's falling on the morning fast. And all the folks between us. This is terrible. This is the worst of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's just it's, it's, it's rising. It's running. Oh, four or five hundred feet into the sky, and it's a terrific crash, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flames rising to the ground, not quite to the morning mass. All the humanity and all the fans are just feeding around it. I don't do it. I can't even talk to people. The fans are out there. It's a, it's a, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laying down mass and smoking wreckage. And everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside while I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. I, 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 I Listen, folks, I, I'm going to have to stop for a minute because I've lost the voices. This is the worst thing I've ever witnessed. I realize that that, that is probably disturbing. If you, if you believe the narrative, that is disturbing as fuck. If you walk into that movie theater in your mind and you think all of this is true, that is horrible. In fact, you could be offended that I told you this. You could even use it to argue that I'm not compassionate. But th this compassion requires a different transaction, my friends. It, right now, there are meth head tweakers that if you bring them an ATM that is full of money, they will consider you uh, an asshole. What I mean by that is, is that compassion requires a certain amount of calories depending on how much you, compassion you live for. Inside that ATM is all the meth that guy needs, but he does not have the calories to get inside it. He is not willing to burn the calories that it takes to open up that machine. It will become something that tortures him and kills him. It will not help him. There is different levels of compassion in this world. There are four, in fact. The very, very first level of on the compassion scale is no compassion. It's unconscious incompetence. I am not aware that I am uncompassionate. That's your, that's your baseline. Okay? I'm not aware that I'm uncompassionate. The second level, I am aware that I am uncompassionate. You have conscious incompetence. You are aware of your incompetence. Believe it or not, that's progress from unconscious incompetence. 
But the second you hit that progress, all you've done is spent calories. All you've done is noticed a calcination. All you've done is noticed a flaw, right? That flaw requires calories. If you do not have the ego, if you do not have the aperture, if you're not willing to enter into the scary house, you're not going to go. If someone forces you, it will never work. All it will do is backfire. Those are the first two levels of compassion, and you still haven't been compassionate yet. The third level is where most of us are right now. That third level is, I want to be compassionate, so I'm going to mimic compassion when I see it. This is a conscious competence. All right. It means I am consciously aware and I can become competent as long as I'm conscious of it. I can repeat what I see. I teach math to someone, someone can repeat it to me. Two plus two is four, two plus two is four. It's not fully grasping math. It's a conscious competence of it. If they are conscious of it, if they're trying, they can repeat it. The fourth level of compassion is where the real gravy starts to flow. And it requires the fourth level of compassion to see what I just showed you. I should have told you this first. <laughs> because believe it or not, you start off as unconscious. Here's your base level. I'm unconsciously aware that I'm incompetent of compassion. So you start unconscious and then you become conscious. I'm conscious that I'm not good at this. And then you stay conscious and you learn to repeat compassion until finally the fourth layer comes and you become unconscious again. You unconsciously exercise what you've learned. Without prompting, without anyone asking, you have deduced that five plus three equals eight. And that's what this requires here. It requires an unconscious competence of learning to see things inside the field of history. And I've never seen a stronger PSYOP about anti-airships than this. Guys, we've had thousands of more people killed in deadly plane crashes than we have on airships. But we still push those and said no, no to these. And I'm going to tell you something. What you're looking at is spliced joined footage. This is not live footage. This is the realest footage I could find for you. And it doesn't even show the crash. I know in your mind you heard that there were people jumping from the, from the, 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 fuck, I forget what you call that. The basket. It's not the basket. <laughs> the gondola. But, but, uh, I know you heard that. And I know that every story says that. And I know that it's completely incompassionate for me to tell a level three that this is bullshit. I, I know how that works. You know how that works. This guy. Where's that fucker? This guy knows how that works. He knows what you want, meaning the collective you. He knows that you don't want to think about an ice wall. He knows you are afraid of your own airship. You were afraid of having to be in charge of your own compassion. You were afraid of our potential. I don't mean you, you. I'm talking about humanity as a whole. What we've been through. And I would argue that the reason why we all agreed to World War I and World War II is because we were afraid of our potential. And we decided that, that we would destroy ourselves here, inside the dome, instead of go out. And someone who would rise to power could feed that. Just as now there are so many people that are hungry for a wall. Donald Trump was rised, could rise and say, I can feed that. And this guy could rise and say, I can feed the end of airships. I can feed the end of mapping the world yourself. I can feed the end of you thinking 
that there's something to be discovered. And I can bury all your giant bones. And I can tell you how wrong we were to try something as crazy as the Hindenburg. And what's fascinating is that the reason why the Hindenburg blew up is because America would not sell them helium. That's why we chose hydrogen. This was this was a hydrogen. This was the hydrogen bomb in its baby infancy, guys. This is the birth of that fear technology. Unwound on all of you. And you're in you're in this class now. Which means we don't get to say, and the evil controllers are trying to blah blah, and they came in and forced us and blah blah. Stop that shit. I'm so tired of those shows that are telling you how fucking deadly everyone else is and how we're innocent. No. No, this is compassion level four, man. We have this new software installed in all of us now. We're using it for our aperture, which means we have to own the fact that we embrace these stories. We embrace this cover up. Because we did not want to see what's beyond that wall. We feel safer here. And we will buy any story we can to not have to go there. This guy right here, Morrison, the guy that said, Oh, the humanity. That same statement you hear everywhere. Oh, the humanity. Made famous by Hollywood, too. This is your first psyop. And it's your first psyop to make you think there's no more land to be discovered. And if you want to, if you're nervous about where that means, what that means, then just think about it like islands. If the elite wanted to hide an island, if there's a centralized mapping company that maps everything, Take it off the map. Just take it off. If you go out and promise everyone the most accurate map in the world, you, you are hiding your island under the very, very, just like medicine, under the very guise of what it pretends to protect, just like UNESCO, under the very guise of what it pretends to protect, our national heritage sites, just like nuclear weapons <laughs> treaties, the very guise of what it is we promise to protect. And we kept on with this. This wasn't the only guy. We like these stories. We like being afraid of hydrogen. And in, in the 3D world, if you're rendering a 3D scene, if you're rendering a castle and you want it to look real, you have to put a bunch of tiny birds in the scene. If you don't put a bunch of tiny birds in the scene flying by, you're not going to get the idea that it's huge. And I'm here to tell you that if you look in this picture right now, you're going to see tiny, tiny battleships that look like they're huge. And you're going to be under the impression that this is something huge. That this is so big that all we can do is hope and pray that we can survive. And so on May 3rd, 1937, with Oh the Humanity, the Led Zeppelin was grounded. And in its place, nuclear bombs were, were raised, atomic weaponry. And the first UN charter was signed in 1945. And the goal, as you can see here on this flyer, one of the first flyers they had, we the peoples of the United Nations determined to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. June 26th, 1945, we came out, the UN came out with this. And they used the Gleason map. And they put it into 33 grids, which we all know about, surrounded it with the Roman laurel. And we announced the UN Charter. We the peoples of the United Nations determined 
to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war, which twice in our lifetime have brought untold sorrow to mankind, World War I, World War II. To reaffirm faith in fundamental human rights, in the dignity and worth of the human person, in the equal rights of men and women, and of nations large and small, to establish conditions which justice and respect for the obligations arising from treaties and other sources of international law can be maintained, and to promote social progress and better standards of life in large freedoms. And the moment that you offer a lifeline, the moment you knock on the door and someone answers and say, hi, would you like world peace? The moment we offer that, June 26th, three weeks later, July 16th, the Trinity bomb is detonated. And on August 6th to 9th, just a month later, we bombed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. While the person selling us peace is on the porch going, hey, would you like world peace? And we're like, world peace? Who would he? And then you look and you see, you see, sorry guys. You see this happening all around you. And just like they scared you with the Hindenburg, they scared you even more. This is Nagasaki right here, or over Nagasaki is what they claim. And we wanted to be scared. We didn't want to go on. We didn't want to go past the, the ice wall. We didn't want to get in an airship and go past the ice wall. We wanted planes that froze if they went anywhere cold. Like Russia. We wanted that instead. And so before that guy left the porch, we said, I will sign your statute. I would love world peace. I would love UNESCO to come in and protect our, all of our heritage sites. That was just three months later. Guys, right in the middle of a world war, UNESCO, at the very right as it's ending, goes, yeah, we're going to be in charge now of all the heritage sites. And it just grew and grew and grew. These people like, like the Doolittle dude, like Rockefeller, like uh, even the... Even Morrison. They're feeding a desire we have. We want to be scared. We want to be kept inside. I don't think this is real right here. I think this looks like a model. Here, I'll show you. This one right here. There's, there's no sound. And if you're thinking about it, if you're thinking about atomic bombs, it's like, holy shit, that's real. God, it's got to be real. It has to be. Because you've already been primed for it. You've already been set up. And you're so thankful that the UN's there to step in. And you're not thinking about airships anymore. You're freaking out. It's, uh... Hey, Vsauce. Michael here. I hate that guy. Every... This, uh... There's no talking about airships when there's nuclear bombs, and both of them are hydrogen explosions. Both of them are, are, are trying to use hydrogen to scare the shit out of you. Both of them were caused by our restriction of this. Not one Zeppelin ever made in Germany crashed. Not one. It was only when there was <laughs> any kind of military operation trying it, uh, England, UK, America, five nations created the UN. It wasn't 51 nations, it was five. China, UK, America, France, Russia. Nuclear countries created the United Nations.
And when you picture the NWO is supposed to be this coming together, and and, and I, I I'm not the kind of I'm not the kind of guy that's like, uh, oh, there's no way that that's impossible. There's no way it happens. When when, when I see someone who meticulously is able to control and knows where everyone's going, and I'm hearing that we're coming towards a new world order, I do the math, and I'm like, what would bring us all together? It wouldn't be enslavement. If the UN was going to enslave everyone, that wouldn't bring anyone together. All that would do is just cause a worldwide conflict where the ones that do not want to be enslaved would fight the ones that do, and that's not really bringing anyone together. In fact, if you see that war playing out, it's that's the antithesis of that. That would cause the opposite reaction of that. So I think, James, how would the NWO bring everyone together? How would that actually work? And the only answer I can come up with is truth. The UN flag, I think I got one here. The UN flag, hear me out. The UN flag is the truth. It's the azimuthal Gleason flat plane. And as, as the NWO is rising, it is the apocalypse itself that brings everyone together. Why? Because Logos is a natural attractor. Anyone who has the adrenals, who wants to do good in their life, will seek out and find logos. Yes, we've been saturated with lies, but we are slowly coming to the truth. Some of us aren't ready for that truth, right? Some of us would rather... rather stay in the dome. But at the end of the road, like at the end of everyone's struggle, when everyone was to reach it, I think you're looking at people uniting under truth. And it's right there. It's right in front of you. What would cause a global, a global coming together? Truth. Only after Aperture opens, though. Only after everyone's ready. Are you ready for the truth? No, I want to stay up here on the monkey bars and throw napalm at each other. Okay. Are you ready for the truth? Yeah, this is kind of sucking. I think I'll try it now. Eventually, everyone will get there. I think that's why we're here. I think that's why we're here, inside the laurels. We're confined by our own fear of airships. Oh, we're confined by our own fear of airships. That's what's got us so scared. That's what keeps us here, inside the zone. This is a slow roll, you know? It's a slow unrolling of the apocalypse. Everything that's, that's being shown to us is comfortable if you're not if it's not forced on you the truth of vaccines is comfortable to you because you understand how psychopathy works you understand how evacuation works if you don't understand how psychopathy or evacuation works the truth of vaccines is uncomfortable to you because you see a world where there's no uh, there's no truth but those people are only seeing that world where there's no truth simply because they only have the capacity, like a meth head has, for truth. James, I don't want a fucking ATM machine that has $6,000 in it. I want someone to put a fucking dollar in this cup right now. That's what I'm hungry for. Right? As we gain our appetite, so too do we gain our compassion. We gain our ability to do that. Uh, I hear you loud and clear, Gaia. As soon as I find that account, I will do it. I don't see it above you, though. But I will definitely do that. Um, yeah. If, if anyone thinks someone else needs to lose a wrench, just let me know. 
I'll, I'll see it. Especially if it's Super Chat. But, like, I'll, I'll see it and, and I'll find it. It may take me a day or two, but I'll find it. Um, thank you. So, our job is to relax. Our job is to learn to let our aperture open as much as possible. Our job is to crush that. Our job is to make that as opening as we can. <laughs> and, uh, right there. No, you go on the other side. And, uh, that's tricky work when you're surrounded by people that don't want to see. It's, uh, it's hard. Or it can be. But it's getting easier. And I, I would like to, uh, to ask each of you to do yourself a favor and ask what it is you want. And as soon as you ask what it is you want, listen to the first answer you give and then ask yourself, is that what I want or is that what I don't want? Is that what I'm trying to avoid? Because if you're trying to avoid the ice wall, you're going to want nuclear weapons. You're going to want a nuclear bomb. You're going to want assholes coming in and telling you that there were no giants. And that airships are dangerous and impossible. Stupid idea. And that everyone has a social security number. And everyone has death and taxes coming. You, you're comfortable in that realm. And as I've said before, atheism gives you privacy from God, which is important. Some of us are here because we need privacy from God. We need to experiment. We need to understand ourselves. We need to try on different fashion, through aperture, through everything. We need to look at the world in a different way. And atheism allows us to do that. So does fucking sodomy. It's a weird world, man. It's a weird world, and I embrace as weird as it takes you to open up your compassion. There's nothing wrong with that. It's All of us are going to be that meth, meth dealer going, man, how do I get in this ATM machine? At one point, you're going to say, I think I have enough calories to get in this ATM machine. And maybe through the ingenuity of figuring out how to get in the ATM machine, you stop doing meth. I don't know. It's not the best analogy. It's not the worst. But that's why we're here. And if I was the NWO, the way that I would eventually bring someone together is tell everybody the truth. And then separate everybody into 51 countries that all had different colors. With stars, some do going this way and bars this way, and, and one religion this way and one religion this way. And I would know that eventually that Taurus, that toroidal field, which you're looking at a top view of a toroidal field of what we call the dome, this electromagnetic toroidal field, will cause enough dissonance in the world where people will finally come together again. But we'll only come together by choice. It'll only be because we want to. And that's why I'm not so worried about the NWO anymore. In fact, I would tell you that you should do... I would like for you to consider this an RX ritual. RX, prescription. Did you guys know that this sigil, RX, is a reverse spell? This sigil right here. is a reverse spell. It's caused to reverse whatever's there. And if you reverse the UN, if you if you put a reverse spell on the UN, every time you see a UN logo, you can pull prana from that. You will not look at it as, oh, those guys are lying to me. You will look at it as, as those guys are telling me the truth. 
It's the first time I've ever seen anyone tell me the truth. And it's right there plain as day. And I'm not asking you to take the mark of the beast, so shut the fuck up, Rocky Roberts, who's like, Oh, you're gonna give me the mark of the beast? I'm gonna fucking tell you that you suck up. No. I'm telling you the only way we will ever align, truly align, under the same TP is under truth. It will be truth. Every one of you guys would agree if it's true. And if you're ready to accept the truth. And that's why you can use this prescription to look at that. Yes, exactly, Chris. How dare I take away the boogeyman from the UN? How dare I do that? And that's exactly what I'm doing. Guys, I was in uh, McDonald's. And they, everyone gave their order receipt. And up on the board it said serving 164, 165, 168, 169. And I placed my order and I got my receipt and it said 666. And I looked up on the board and it said waiting 666. And I held that 666 and I took a picture of the receipt. Because it made me happy. It brought me joy to see 666. And if you understand how the prana economy works, my compassion, not consent, my compassion for 666 allowed me to see what the Kabbalistic meaning of that number actually meant. And I saw carbon atom. And I saw six electrons, six protons, six neutrons. And I saw the resonance of man. And I like man. I am a man. Man are cool. I don't hate man. I don't fear man. I certainly don't think man is the devil. I think man is the antithesis of the devil. So when I get that 666, I'm empowered by it. I don't go out because I have such a little compassion like a meth head and go, QAnon, 666 going to fucking kill me. We got to go fucking do this and burn shit down. We got to vote red because all the Democrats are the pedophiles. And I don't have to go that way. I don't have to be a tweaker about it. I can see that and go, wow, what a powerful number. This is cool as hell. How come I got this and everyone else has these different numbers? I draw power from it now. Just like a meth head who figures out how to open the ATM. He draws power from it now. He's like, I, I'm the most skilled meth head around. Why? Because I have a fucking grinder. Yep. I went to Harbor Freight and bought a grinder. And now I can get in this ATM. It's a different world. He's opened his aperture with a fucking grinder. And now all that meth's going to come in. He'll die. But the analogy was still good up until he died. It was still good. Because that's, that's really, that's what we're doing. And that's how this whole thing works. Tomorrow... Benjamin Balderson is going to be here. We're going to talk about anointing. Some of you asked about cannabis. Join us tomorrow. We will talk about it. We'll, we'll talk all about it. Tomorrow is also open office hours for patrons. If you're a patron and you want to come into a live Zoom chat with us and ask questions or tell us what you think or tell me where I'm wrong or get advice from others or just listen, you are welcome to do that. We'd love to have you. We do record these and publish them because my patrons are so cool. We don't want to create content that only they can see. If you want to participate, you got to be a patron. But you can see what we talk about uh, because we'll be publishing them on the site. Um, thank you to all my patrons for doing that. And thank you for being here. There's a lot of people that were timed out here, I see. Um, do me a favor, guys. If anyone thinks someone needs to lose their wrench, if you could think of their name, just, just type their name right now in the chat, and I'll be sure and, and, and give it a look and see. Um, someone described the wrenches as Lord of the Flies, and I just really have been chuckling all morning about that. I think that's a really good way of putting it. And I think the Lord of the Flies experiment is a great a great thing for us. Yes, yeah, same time tomorrow. It's always uh, I always try and be here 11 a.m., um, and uh, except for maybe Sunday, I usually try and take at least one day off, and Sunday seems to be that day. But tomorrow it will be with Benjamin and uh, maybe a few others. There's uh, a rumor that Ceiling Fan Man might be joining me, so we'll see. Um, how do I get a wrench, Joshua? You, you do not have to ask that question anymore. Um, yeah. Find your airship, guys. Stop, stop, stop buying the bullshit. The 
the Hindenburg, the nuclear weapons, the ball earth. Hats off, Michael. I know you're probably like, James, will you stop that? But I'm telling you, Michael, the truth is right there on that flag. Thank you, Guy Bear. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day. And, uh, yeah, if you missed my stream yesterday, catch it. It's a good one. Um, yeah, thanks for being here. Hey, check out Owen Benjamin. He's on DLive. Uh, starts, you know, usually like 10, 15 minutes. If you've never been to DLive, you should check it out. Someone's going to put a link in the chat to it it's actually kind of hard to check them out so i recommend you you uh you you doing that and uh yeah 